Welcome to the Channel Chat Podcast. Proudly sponsored by Convergent Technology. Hello, I'm Mark Sumner, host of the Channel Chat Podcast show. And today I have the pleasure of Alistair Borisso, which is actually, I was going to say your new title, which is the Global Head of Circular Technologies, which no one knows what that means. Exactly. Quite frankly, yeah. Alistair. So that job title, but we'll come, we'll come to that in a minute, your, your new job title and what you're doing. Because I'll, I want to take you back, first of all, because you are the first Australian or dual nationality person we've had on the show. Really? So you are, okay, yeah, well, you are yeah. setting a precedent here. So uh, right. I want to take you back because I, I, when I looked at your LinkedIn profile today, and I think I mentioned it to you before, that I saw that you started your career, mm-hmm. actually your education, in, is it mechanical engineering? Or electrical electric, engineering. Electrical yeah, engineering. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so <coughs> let, let's take it back to Australia. What, how, let, how, why did you decide to do that? Yeah, well, I guess um, I always had an interest in electronics. So I used to always pull apart radios and sort of uh, different, different things there. But um, I sort of, when I left school, I, I liked the concept of going into the electrical engineering area and sort of building things. But actually, interesting enough, did the first few years of a degree and then realized actually... I was more interested in the business side of it rather than necessarily the building side of it. So, uh, right. yeah, that, and that sort of uh, set me in the direction, in a different direction. And you, then you got a job, and where did you go into? I actually went into retail. Uh, sort of, I, I continued in my passion of electronics, and there's a, maybe an unknown business uh, over here in the UK, but quite well known in Australia, a company called Dick Smith Electronics. Uh, Dick Smith is a known entrepreneur. He was known for flying around the world in helicopters, but he also set up this... Uh, Basically, I think it was a sort of a leading edge electronics store where the first, the dawn of computers and electronics and mobile phones, the first ever mobile phones that were sold by Telstra over there. You know, I was selling those to customers in those days, leading that, you know, running a store. And actually, that was where I developed the passion for technology. uh, And that's what I've always been very interested in. Now, you've then made the transition, which not many people seem to be able to do which was going into retail, which is business to consumer, and then yep. making the tr- transition into business to business and corporate sales and a, and a, a corporate uh, career in IT. Sure. How, how did you do that? Because if, I'm gonna be honest, most yep. people that come to me that are in retail, I say to them, it's really hard to get into corporate world. So how, how did you do that? Because it, yeah. it would have been, I would have thought it'd been even tougher in those days as well. It was, it was really, really difficult. And in fact, actually, it was one of the things that prompted me to come back to the UK. So I was born over here, but went to Australia when I was about seven. And I grew up over there, but but trying to make that transition from basically retail electronics, even though I'd run stores and and done things and I knew a lot about technology, trying to move from retail sales to corporate sales is almost an impossible mission. And actually, that was what prompted me to say, you know what, maybe you know UK is a smaller market, maybe different opportunity and much easier because there was more opportunity over here at that time. So that was what prompted me to make that move back in 94. So 94, relocate back to uh, the UK, yep. and then you join your first corporate business-to-business role, which is, I believe, in customer services. That's yeah, how you it got your was. Break. Yeah, so actually at the time, Telstra, so big big name, obviously, uh, in Australia, the, the Australia's BT. So Telstra was setting up a London office for their international business, and uh I actually got into them by basically using my customer services background from retail. So corporate sales was, well, what do you know about corporate sales? You know about retail, consumer sales. But it was because I had that customer services background that gave me that break within Telstra. And was that via CVs? Because I, I would have thought, I would have thought even in those days, your CV would have got rejected having a well, one being from yeah. Australia. Yeah, yeah. And you're not, you're not, you're not, you're not, <laughs> not, not that I'm not, not discriminating against Australians, but one being from a different country, but also you hadn't had any UK experience, but also you were still in retail. So yeah. sending, sending that CV off, would no, they have picked you out? Well, you know what? I think I, I did do a lot of research on CV writing. I became a bit obsessed uh, with doing that and obviously trying to make sure that you structure, and I think that's the important thing when you're writing a CV, is obviously you've got different opportunities to, to pull from, but yeah. structuring the CV for the job I was going for. So I realized that it was all about customer centricity and all about, and that was obviously the background I'd had. So if I'd gone in about sales and so forth, it wouldn't have been that that good a message. But but in retail, you do genuinely learn how to actually deliver what customers want. And you get to, you're in the front line with people as well, which I think was a really important part of it. So you got your break, and then after a few years, you joined the small company, which is now the big company of Cisco. Yeah. How, how did you get the break into Cisco? Yeah, because I, well, while I was at Telstra, 
Um, I guess I, I originally did a couple of years in the customer services role. I then really got the break into this corporate sales at Telstra. And that was, you know, I proved myself that I actually could could deal with large customers and actually had really good relationships. They then gave me an opportunity to move into sales. I actually closed their largest deal, which was with British Aerospace at the time, uh, and actually turned out to be their largest customer ever. And I think that gave me that sort of springboard within Telstra. I, I continued that for several years. I was there for about five years. But actually, I could see that there was a really a dawning that was happening from what was then voice and PSTN moving across to data. And that's when I thought, OK, now's the time to move into a much more of a data centric company. And that's when I, I started out applying to Cisco. And I believe you took a pay cut to actually do that. I did actually, yeah. That was one of the hardest things to do actually. Because <laughs> sounds uh, people taking pay yeah, cuts like an nerd of in the channel. Well, it was a pay cut on paper, but actually, thankfully, it didn't turn out to be that way. But one of the, yeah, that's I think, I guess one of the, I guess lessons I've learned is sometimes to take a pay cut on paper, provided you've got an opportunity to overachieve and provided it's heading in the right career direction you want to go in, it's worth doing that because it's not all about the the OTE particularly if you believe in yourself in sales, right? If you believe yeah. in yourself and you have upside opportunity, then you, you know there is no limit. Do you think that's key for when candidates are looking at careers now in the IT channel that they, they should be looking at the technology? So I'll give an example. Yeah. Distribution is normally less well paid than the vendors, but yeah. some of the vendors, if it's a, maybe a hardware vendor, they're not gonna be well paid as more of a security vendor. So, when you think candidates are looking for a career mode, what do you think they should be considering when actually, is it the technology, is it the, the, the type of company, is it where they sit in the channel, what, what, what's your opinion? I think it really is about the type of the company, their ethos, and yeah. really their capabilities and where you think they're going. For example, when I, look at, when, I, when I joined Cisco, I had two choices and I actually had two offers, one was with Cisco and one was with Sun. So in those days, you know, we're talking about the, the 2000s, just before yeah. the bubble burst. You know, Cisco and Sun were sort of neck and neck as far as desirability. Yeah, were, yeah. But actually, when I interviewed with both of them, um, Cisco was much more open standards, much more about we want our people to be productive and, and give them the best tools for the job. Whereas Sun was much more about closed ecosystem. Yeah, we, we run on Lotus Notes rather than Microsoft. And but, you know, it does the job. But that they wanted to keep that very closed ecosystem. And that was actually part of my decision making criteria, because candidly, the Sun was a better offer on paper as far as salary, but Cisco, again, you could see where they were going to go. So I think a lot of it's about making the decision based on who the company is you're joining and, and really what they've got going for them, because that's really where you're going to end up, and that's really going to be your day job as well. Yeah. So you've picked, you started your career at Cisco. Um, I know you were, went, you sold into the finance sector for quite a bit of the time, yeah, and yeah. Morgan Stanley. Yeah. Um, then you got your first job job into into management. How was that from being a contributor for quite a long time? Sort yeah. of six or seven years, eight yep. years? Yep. And then you got your first job, job as a general manager. How was the jump? Well, I guess I'd done management previously, particularly in retail. So I'd had sort of and actually even at Telstra I actually managed a small team in the aerospace industry. So I'd I'd had had that experience. It wasn't the first time, but it was I guess it was the first step up. And I think I guess as an individual contributor, it's great because you control your own destiny and you control your own salary to a certain extent. Yeah. I think when you actually start moving into management and, and leading a team, it is all about can I actually lead through them and drive and mentor them to be successful? And I guess it's a bit of a double-edged sword. On one hand, it's great because if you are successful, you feel like you've actually achieved something and grown with people, whereas it's much less of a self-orientated, you know, not that salespeople are never selfish, of course, but <laughs> it's much more of a less self-orientated uh, way to be successful. And I, you know, I really enjoyed it. So I think it was a bit of a bit of both. And I'd done my time as an individual contributor as well. So I felt like I'd sort of was ready for a change. How, what, what, actually, it's an interesting point about you know individual contributors and management. But myself, I hate managing people. I really, really don't like it. Yeah. I don't really like. It, it's the it's the dependency on other people. And of course, you sure. want to win with the team. Yeah. That's that being selfless and, and moving into management. When do you think you know you're uh, an individual's ready? Because if you have been successful as an individual contributor, you're normally earning good money. You're it's in your own hands. You don't really have to worry about other people's feelings. You don't have to worry about other people's yep. challenges or, or trials and tribulations. How do you know when you're ready to actually make the move? Because there's a lot of people I come to me and they say, "Oh yeah, I've done my time in a contributor role. I'd like to move into management." It's like you don't. 
You don't. It's a lot of hassle, and it's you. And normally, and especially in middle management, you don't earn as much money as the individual. I, I was about to say. I was going to say it's, it's the time when you're ready for a pay cut. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But in all honesty, it is it is a bit like that because you're right. When you're actually an individual contributor, if you do your number and then overachieve, you can be on the beach literally. Yeah. Whereas as a manager, you do your number. You still got things to do, people to respond to, etc. So I think. I think largely it's it's some people I would say what I have seen is people who want to be managers really don't know what they want and and don't know what they're going to get. Yeah. So I'd say think hard about that. It really has got to be for reasons where you actually want to do it because you like coaching people, mentoring people and you feel like, you know, is it you can do more than you can do as an individual contributor. I mean, I'd say candidly, it also does get a bit boring as an individual contributor doing the same year on year on. Some people love it and I think that actually is it, you've got to look at you as an individual and what drives you and motivates you. Talking of getting bored and, and what motivates you, we, we, we spoke at lunch about changing jobs over a period of time. And there's maybe yeah. after two or three years of, of doing the same job, you need to sort of look out of, of the opportunities. Now, that could either be in the company, they give you another opportunity internally, yeah. or outside. Now, three years isn't a long period of time. So why why did you sort of tell me that sort of time frame where you think actually that's a good time to start looking because half the time the first year if you're a contributor you might be settling in then you might be establish yourself to year two year three is might be the year you're actually getting some results so why is it the time to sort of consider other moves Yeah I mean well candidly it's not what I have done it's but it's what I have observed right. so I've I've always done more than that uh, but actually I've looked at sim- similar people I've known throughout the industry. And those that have moved around every few years, and it doesn't need to necessarily be moving externally, by the way, yeah. but I find that if you do stay in the same role for too long, you're basically, you know, you're letting yourself, you know, you're allowing yourself to almost just be in a, in a rut, even though you might be doing very, very well. Whereas those, I think, who have moved on, changed roles, either within the company or outside of the company, generally they accelerate quicker. Also, what I've noticed is some companies actually value external talent much more than they value internal talent. So you get almost a, a ceiling sometimes within your own organization where you feel like actually if, if you go outside, you can move up and do get more experience as well. Yeah, what, why do you think that is? Because there's, there's a lot of companies I sort of see that maybe, especially the vendors, they might rotate yeah. VPs two years here, two years here, but it's the same individuals. Yeah. It's very hard to break into that sort of VP club where you're actually getting those yeah. big jobs. What, why is that, do you think? What, you know, why, do, why do people think actually bringing this external person is going to you know, it's gonna work miracles, whereas maybe there's a general manager, he'd like to be a VP, but he just doesn't get a break. Yeah, I mean, I, well, candidly, I experienced that from, from the inside as well. Really? Uh, you know, at Cisco... Often we, we found that when I was, I was actually heading sales for, for the division, Cisco Refresh, the remanufactured equipment division, but they would often bring in new leaders who really didn't have any experience and background uh, of, of that particular role, but they were doing it generally to, because they had proven track records in running divisions and businesses. And I guess that can be quite frustrating when you're internal inside and you've lived and breathed that business from the inside out not to necessarily be given that break. And I think that's also sometimes why you need to move on and go and change roles because if you realize that they're just gonna keep bringing in new leaders to run the business, then actually if you don't make a change yourself, then you're wasting your time. Now, talking of making a change, some might say this is a crazy move from going from a tier one distributor, Mm. being in the role that you're in, and then you went to distribution because most people I, I find start in distribution and then really want to get to you know a vendor, especially like Cisco. Yeah. And you did it the other way around. What made you go to distribution? You know what? It really was about um, sort of increasing my experience and actually also candidly, I felt like I'd done all I could do within the group within Cisco at the time. So it was, do I go? Do I go into other areas within Cisco? And I'd been twenty years at Cisco, which is a long time anywhere. And actually, an opportunity came along, which was actually at Westcom, which was really too good to be true. It was like, come across, take what you know and you've learned in Cisco, yeah. but almost do it from scratch within Westcon as an organization. And I had already done retail. I'd done service provider. I'd done a vendor. I'd then done the manufacturing supply chain parts of the vendor. Distribution was the only bit only really bit I, hadn't, I hadn't done. I hadn't done. <laughs> so I thought, well, why not do it? Because actually, it's a great learning experience as well. 
Now, Westcon's a great company. I've dealt with them myself for 20 years. In fact, it was one of the, the first placements I ever did in my, my, early, my early 20s. So I've got a very fond memories of them as a company and I've seen them established over the last 20 years. One of the things I hear about in distribution now is supply chain issues. Absolutely. So yeah. tell me, because uh, what I understand is you can get lots of bookings and it's all seems great, it all seems great, but you can't deliver the product. You can't well, ship them. Yeah, exactly. So I mean, it's it's obviously not distribution challenge. It's our it's our vendors, right? They're the so so. There's a massive, as anybody will have noticed, in any industry you're in at the moment, the supply chain is on its knees everywhere. And really, I guess if you look at it from IT distribution, we when we went into the pandemic, there was this uncertainty of is there going to be a drop or is there going to be a, a growth spurt? As it turned out, there was a massive growth spurt that happened. Uh, you know, in the first year of the pandemic, we now have a situation that we have pent up demand that just can't be achieved. And so the backlogs are significant everywhere. And I think we're going to be in a good two or three years of supply chain challenges. Really? That, that long? I think so. I mean, I think if you look at actually the, some of the fundamentals that actually are driving this sort of shortage, you know, it's the fab plants, the, the silicon manufacturers. You can't, once you're at 100% capacity, you can't do any more than 100%. And actually, some of these fab plants that actually create the silicon, you, to build another one costs 10 billion in five years. So it's not like you can just magically turn on more of them. So I think we're in a supply chain challenge for a long time. Plus, the consumption's gone up. Because of the back of the pandemic, home working and just generally the way we're operating, the consumption of IT is going through the roof. So we're in this sort of bubble at the moment that is actually self-fulfilled bubble but it's constrained bubble as well. So we're in this, you know, e either, and you know, we've got some challenges happening in the world at the moment as well, which might actually slow down growth, which might allow the supply chain time to catch up. But I think it's gonna be a bit of a chicken and egg syndrome for the next few years while we're gonna be living this sort of supply chain constrained world. Now, I've heard of sustainability. It's been a topic that's been brought up over the last six months and the channel chat listeners have asked me to ask people about it. You are the first person I've ever heard of this job title of is Global Head of Circular Technologies. Now, I made that one up, by the way. Yeah, so. well, I think you must have done because <laughs> I, I, I actually don't know what circular means. Okay. So, it, no, you're telling me it's linked to sustainability, but I yeah. don't really understand what circular technology means. So, so yeah. explain to the listeners what you actually mean by that. Sure. So, so I actually got, I guess, involved in what was called the circular economy, and it's called the circular economy when I actually worked in the remanufacturing division. And actually, there's a Ellen MacArthur Foundation. She's a leader in creation of the circular economy. So really, the circular economy is about don't it's not the linear economy is where you actually, you know, you create and you build and you distribute and you sell and then you, you scrap. So it's, you know, traditional supply chain. The circular economy is, hang on, why do I need to build something from scratch if I have a product that actually could be reused or remanufactured and redeployed? And, and obviously, my exposure is in the IT industry and in the technology industry, but it's happening everywhere. Look at eBay. eBay is an example of the circular economy. Everyone's back, there's a lot of new products, but the mostly used products on eBay. And that's actually all about, hang on, why would I want to buy new if I can buy used? Now, the challenge is traditionally with the circular economy is there's a lot of uncertainty about quality and so forth and that's i guess just one of the major obstacles that needs to be overcome and that is the gray market is that right so if i if i if if if, if i if i want to do a refresh of my office which i have done recently yeah i could either go new or i could go used but with used i'm not sure if it's going to be have a license i'm not sure if it's going to be maintained correctly i'm not sure well, I'm not sure on the quality of it. So Absolutely. is that some of the issues is, is going to happen? Yeah, and that's, I guess that's the challenge with the circular economy is making sure that you know what you're going to get. If you look at the grey market, I mean, the grey market, grey effectively means not through an authorised channel by definition. That's well, grey actually means it's colour, but by definition, the actual grey is all the unauthorised channel. So the authorised channel is not grey. And the challenge with the grey market is you don't know what you're going to get. It might be counterfeit, and actually in technology, there's a lot of counterfeit product out there. Really? So, yeah. That? So it's not just about is it going to break, being is it actually counterfeit, is it actually legitimate? And then there's software. A lot of product really now is hardware and software, and making sure that the software is, is A, licensed, and B, actually supportable is a critical part now, because just buying the box, if the software isn't going to run on it or isn't licensed, 
then uh, you may end up with something that's just going to not work or break. And when these when these are decisions are made around sustainability, I sort of get the I get the impression from the vendors it's quite a good PR um, stint to sort of say yeah it's the green agenda and we're sustainable and we're doing it for the people and it's all the right thing to do. Hmm. Whereas really, is there much more of a commercial aspect to it? Because you know we're talking about when we're getting products, we can they can test it and maybe charge for that. Yep. They can relicense and maybe charge for that. So where, where is the balance between doing the right thing and actually actually we're going to make a load of money out of this? Yeah, I think, I think it's fair to say that traditionally, and we're going back probably three to five years, it was a tick in the box. You know, yeah. we have to say green, we have to say we're green because it's the right thing to do. Now though, literally in the last 12 to 18 months, two years, there's been a step change. It now is a fundamental requirement. And in fact, if you look at where... Uh, the analysts are putting sustainability. It is in the upper top right of the quadrant. It's even above diversity. Sustainability is now number one on the objectives of CXOs, literally across all major corporations. And the reason is, is because they realise that actually, the careabouts in the world have changed dramatically. You know, commercial is important. And actually, what I love about what I'm now doing in this new role is I'm connecting commercial with with the the green sustainability the right elements because actually you think about sustainability it's great but if it costs you more and you get less no one's going to do it exactly so if you can actually say actually it's great and you get more and it costs you less it's a no brainer and i think that's really the tipping point now the the technology and some of the thought process around it i think are still a little bit you know a little bit traditional of let's make sure we have our sustainability check in the box but actually if you double click on that now there are fundamental commercial reasons to want to do it it's look at the supply chain hang on i can't get it new but if i can get it used and i can make sure it's as good as new i can get this one now i can or i can wait 12 18 months for the new one what are you going to do what what is the quality like though because everyone's going to worry about actually if i buy something second hand or uh, on the sustainability agenda, it's not going to be as good. Is the quality there? It's really important that you actually, this is why I think the vendor remanufacturing programs are key, which obviously is what I, I led at Cisco, is it's really important that you, you know what you're going to get. And yeah. I think that is that means it's either got to be a remanufactured, a certified remanufactured product from the vendor, or at least be endorsed by the vendor. So for example, if it's been relicensed and the vendor's you know, endorse that, then then I think that's the major thing you're looking for. If it is used and off the grey market, then it really is a bit of a lucky dip process. And, you know, I think some there are some times when people just really have to do that because you have no other choice. But I think if I was going to do a major deployment, I'd want to make sure it was, you know, genuine certified. You mentioned there about the analysts put it in the in the, the top quadrant of, of Gartner um, above diversity. What, why do you think that is happening? Why, why is it the hot topic now? Because it, you know, I, I looked on LinkedIn and I thought, actually, I saw two years ago, I thought, actually, Alistair did say, becoming a trusted advisor for sustainability will become the future channel differentiator. That's what yeah. you said. So, one, do you still agree with I that? I still do, actually. You yeah, still agree with that, that, that comment. <laughs> but, but, yeah. but why do you think it's on the, on the agenda? Because our company's now going to have a sustainability strategy. Is that what's going to happen? Because well, as a small company, I'm not thinking about it. No. But now I'm, I'm starting to, I've interviewed a couple of people now um, and you've educated me today on it, and I'm sort of thinking, is it on my agenda? Not really. It's not really on my agenda, but it, it, you're saying it's going to really come to the, to the, the forefront. Yeah. The reason it's more and more is actually buying decisions by large corporations, it's now becoming a prerequisite to do business with an organisation that they have a really? sustainable supply chain. Absolutely. And there are different levels of sustainability. And I'm not a sustainability expert, by the way. I've got a guy who works with, with me at Westcon who is. But the, the difference is, if you are not, if you don't have, have covered the major sustainability objectives, you may not get an opportunity to bid. So it's almost like, firstly, before you actually can even bid, tell me about your sustainability credentials. Wow. But secondly, the, the reason that is, is because it's now become so important to the sort of, to the, to the bottom line of the companies as well, their annual reports to show that they have a sustainable initiative. And I said, it's really being driven by governments and, and, I, and also by people. People don't want to do business with non-sustainable companies anymore. If your company is not a company that believes in really doing the right thing for the future, do you want to do business with that company? 
So I think that's really becoming a key criteria now. And previously, it may have seemed a bit like the green box, but I think truly mm. now in the last couple of years, I mean, you've seen it. There's so some crazy stuff going on. Yeah. Uh, it's become important to people to do the right thing. What initiatives have you seen within the channel to sort of drive sustainability? Uh, well, I guess, I mean, personally, the initiative I'm working on at the moment with Westcon is, yeah. is a pretty major one. It's, it's working with Cisco and it's, it's around the circular supply chain. So it's all about making it easier. Uh, so that's a major initiative we're doing now. You'll see more and more vendors are actually setting up remanufacturing divisions. Uh, you know, Cisco led the way and which was why it was a great place to be. I mean, look at Apple. They now have their trading programs. Um, actually, I know a number of people from Cisco went to Apple and actually you know, helped to, to develop those programs as well. So I think we're seeing more and more organizations thinking about take back programs and remanufacturing and reuse programs as part of their, as part of their commercial prime offer. It used to be this sort of dirty secret that yeah, you know, we'll deal with that behind the scenes, but now it's actually become much more of the forefront. We hope you're enjoying this episode of the Channel Chat podcast. And now a few words from our sponsor. Channel Chat is brought to you by Convergent Technology. The Convergent team is made up of experienced and innovative IT professionals. Our mission is to disrupt the traditional reseller market, and we want the most aspirational salespeople to join our team and part of our journey. We know IT sales has a bad rep, so we've created a rewarding culture with the best remuneration and career progression in the industry. Check out ConvergentTechnology.com for more info. When you moved into Westcom, what what, would, what did you find were the main differences between having a, a career of 20 years at Cisco and working from distribution? Because lots of people would have thought, me saying it, and I, yeah, I love yeah. Westcom as a company, me saying it would have thought, he's got really good tenure there, really good job. Mm. Distribution's quite tough, tough place to, to, to add value, tough yeah. place to, to, it's very fast paced. What, what do you see as the differences? I think the difference is Cisco is an oil tanker, right? And ultimately to turn that oil tanker takes a lot. I mean, I, I when I was, you know, talking about different areas with the remanufacturing group, how to evolve that, you know, you're talking about large organization, which is, it takes a long time. Whereas when Westcon, some of the achievements, you can actually make stuff happen very quickly. So I think being an agile, with an agile organization, sometimes is just really refreshing. It's like, hang on, you can make a decision and get that done. Whereas with Cisco, you need a lot of people to agree to it before you can actually make a major change. I think that's really what, what, I, what excites me about. And it's a bit like at Telstra in the early days, that was a startup. It was a, it was a, a small spin-off of a large company. Things you can achieve in a startup is amazing. And that's why often startups prosper when they're in that sort of outside of the mothership. Uh, but, you know, back onto the Westcon side, it was really just the ability to get stuff done. Let's move on to talent. Um, Alistair, which is sure. talent, obviously, is a, a, a very close to my heart running a recruitment company. Yeah. Like, like the supply chain shortages, there's lots of talent shortages at the moment. How do you go about <clears throat> attracting people to distribution? And uh, again, uh, um, they don't have the salary pools of maybe some of the bigger vendors. Yeah, sure. uh, maybe they compete with the partners. How do you go actually about attracting talent and, and get them to be excited about joining not just at Westcom, yeah. in, in distribution in general. So I would say general distribution is is a great proving ground for sales for a start because you are actually, you know, there's a lot of selling that goes on in distri distribution. I think it's it's seen as box shifting, yeah. candidly. Yeah. You know, if you don't know the particular distributor, if you take Westcom, for example, it is a very value-added distributor. You know, if it had been a, a box shifting type distributor, there's no way I would have been interested to work there for a start. So I think it is make firstly understand that as a direction, you know, what is the ethos as the company and where are they going? Secondly, it's what is what is the role? If it's a sales role and you're owning customer relationships, that's also very exciting. But I think most importantly, the breadth of experience you can get in distribution is second to none. If you look at the vendors, I mean I you know, I knew Cisco through and through. But I'd never dealt with all of the other vendors we deal with now, which is Paolo, Checkpoint, F5, Avaya, you name it. I knew them as competitors, but I'd never actually worked with them. So I think the experience you can get across the whole IT portfolio, both from a vendor perspective, the solutions you're dealing with, and just the complexity, it's a buzz. You know, it's a really exciting buzzing place. Whereas the vendors generally, or you know what you know because you're dealing with 
that particular vendor portfolio, but you don't know what you don't know. And that's why I think distribution gives you that breadth of uh, exposure. When you're dealing with a vendor, say F5 or whoever, whoever it is, what are the main challenges you face with them? Because they're looking at you <coughs> to mm-hmm. get their stock out into the market to as many partners through, whether it's marketing, buybacks, initiatives, or whatever it is. So they must be putting lots of demands on you when you're not getting market share and you're not increasing it. So what is the relationship like? Is it quite fractious or is it? Is it? It's funny and I won't mention any specific names, but it does vary depending on the vendor. Some right. vendors see you as a value add and some really just think, just do what you're told. Just told. Get exactly. You. Get on with it. It is. It is. And I think that's, I guess, me having been on the other side of the fence probably is also how I respond to that. Because generally, the vendors that actually work more closely with you will get the best out of you. And I think it's, it's about, do you treat that as a partnership or are you treating it as a, just do what you're told? And obviously, those that are out there, you, of course, you know, business is business. You will do what you're told. But ultimately, <laughs> if you're you, about delivering value, it's where you actually work as a partnership. How, how, how do you best get a partnership with a distributor? Because, you know, whether it's Cisco, whether it's F5, whether it's Checkpoint, whoever it is, how do you establish a good a good relationship with a distributor? The funny thing is, there's a perception that you're just the distributor. You're just going to move the box at the end. Do what you're told. You'll get the discount. That is the get. perception. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, it is. It, yeah. It's also in reality sometimes. But if you bring, and for example, the area that I was responsible for, the global customers group, they're the major SPs, SIs, etc. around the world. If you engage with distribution early, and if you engage with your you know, it, it has to be, and I say distribution, I mean, Westcon have a model where we have high-touch account managers for those global customers. But if you bring us in early, when you get to the delivery of the project, it will go smoothly. We're talking about global locations. Customs is challenging. Getting product from A to B is challenging. Making sure it doesn't cost you more when it arrives is challenging. But if you engage them early, and it also, if with supply chain shortages, there might be ways that we can work together to get stuff quicker, or there might be certain products that we know are on a long lead time. So what's the point of positioning that product if actually you could work with a different product? So the early engagement, I would say, because traditionally it's like, we'll engage with you once the deal's done and you'll get this margin and therefore you can just pass it through, right? It's the early engagement. So if I I was a new vendor coming to the market and I I came to, and it was, I was a security vendor and I wanted to go through distribution, what would you see is the, the perceived benefits of, of me using not not saying Westcon, I'm just saying a distributor. Yeah. What what would I what would I need to get out of it to think actually this is gonna work? Say I've been going direct for years, I thought actually I want to establish a channel channel model. I've come to two security distributors and I want to establish a channel and I want it to work. What 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 do I need to look for? Yeah, that's an interesting question because that there's a perception that actually software. Well, why would I buy software from a distributor? It's not even a physical product. Mm. But actually because the I guess the, the systems have been developed so well, uh, it's firstly the financing is one option, right? Which ultimately customers are often looking for not just the financing on the software element, but on the whole offer. Yeah. So there's the ability to finance the wrapper. Then there's the the I guess the renewals capability. So effectively, you know, when you're selling something once, you actually want to make sure that it gets renewed, and you want yeah. to make sure that there's also the opportunity to cross sell and upsell as well. So fundamentally, you know, if I'm if I'm selling a particular item that, you know, you might sell that into a customer, but we have we track databases across everything that everyone's bought. And the ability to use that in a proactive sales role to cross sell and upsell as well is very powerful. But if you're just focused on doing your own thing, if you're a vendor saying one particular yeah. product, hang on, what am I missing out on by what I don't know? You know, often you're selling what you have because yeah. that's what you know, but actually by working with a distributor, they, they're selling everything to that customer. So they're having a very customer-centric approach, at least I should say from a global customer's perspective. Yeah. And, and then they know what's going on in the market, so they can help guide you to where is your most successful fit. Do you think you get a stickier relationship using distribution with the customer? I think you do. I mean, if you yeah. look at some of the go-to-markets of some of our major vendors, um, funnily enough, you know, some of the vendors are literally purely distribution only. They have a choice. They could sell direct. But also, the vendors don't want the headache of often, you know, if you take, you know, being quite honest, I mean, and some of our customers may be watching, they're hard work, right? Yeah. So, <laughs> so if you're a vendor, do you want all your resources consumed by serving the customer? Or do you want that consumed by just delivering good products and actually delivering the, the solution to that customer? 
rather than maintaining that customer relationship. So I think there's a there's pros and cons on both sides. And actually, we often have seen that there actually has been a, a big push, even with direct business going via distribution now, because fundamentally we can do the creative stuff that, that you couldn't necessarily do if you're going direct. So even if I'm a vendor and I deal direct, I might identify something direct. And instead of doing it with through me, I'd, I'd almost give you the margin because it will, it will it will be easier to go do that deal through exactly. distribution. Exactly, particularly on global deployments, for example. So right. if you're doing a global deployment, if you're going, if the customer is buying direct, that means you as the vendor have to deal with every aspect of making sure that all those products get to the right place at the right time. Or you can deal with a distributor that effectively says, actually, I'll run all that for you. You know, it's worth giving away some extra margin yeah. to that distributor to make it run smoothly. Yeah, hassle free. Yeah. Let's go back to recruitment for a minute. So I want to. I've got a couple mm -hmm. of few quick fire questions for you that um, I ask most of the guests. Um, okay. And I've had some really funny answers. So I'm hoping you can you can answer some of these. When interviewing with yourself, how does a candidate really impress you at interview? What what what's the tips you'd give someone? I would say make sure you know about the organisation you're applying to. Because fundamentally, if you don't know that, then you've sort of fallen at the first hurdle. Yeah. So make sure you've done your homework. Um, make sure that, I guess, again, have something important or valuable to offer and to share as an example of something you've done. You know, often people will talk about themselves and what they want out of a role and why they think they're good. Yeah. But if you can demonstrate why you've done good things and important things, that's way more valuable and credible when you're interviewing than uh, I'm great, so you should give me the job. That's yeah, the best. It's got to be two way, isn't it? Exactly. But what's the funniest moment you've had, either as a candidate or a hiring manager during an interview? Has anything jumped out? Well, I actually had Neil Neil Burton, who was at F5, who who was at Proofpoint, and he gave me the funniest one, which I, I've sent the clip out so many times. I, I really did laugh. But is really is really for sort of funny ones well, that's your crew. I guess it's two. But well, one a funny moment during an interview, and this is going back probably about eighteen months ago. Um, I was interviewing this uh, gentleman, and you know, he was he was taking some notes out, but he sort of um, he didn't have his notebook with him, so he pulled out a piece of paper out of his pocket, and it was scrumpled up. Right. And he, he unfolded it, and he, his his um, daughter had been scrolling on it, and <laughs> and he's he, and he's writing writing out notes or whatever on that. And sort of it was a bit of a distraction in the first. So that was I guess pretty funny. If so I, he had like a, like a kid's note in his, it, his basically, top pocket. He had a piece of paper that was sort of half scrunched oh, up and pulled out. But anyway, that was. Uh, Did you know, give him the job? No. <laughs> I don't believe you. <laughs> but but I guess I was talking about memorable moments, which is quite similar. And I go, I'm going back to, I won't mention where, but yeah. many years ago, many, many years ago, uh, where actually I, I just joined a company and uh, there was a group, group it was a small group of, had about six salespeople, two customer service and two uh, system engineers. And the manager had been reading this new book uh, called Maverick. Uh, I think it came out about 1993 and it was a, about the unorthodox management techniques. And I remember our first meeting as a team, we were sort of sat around a, a table and uh, and the first thing he said to us is, right, we're gonna break the ice. There's sort of nothing off off nothing off bars, you know, every, everyone's, you know, it's a safe environment here. And I want just everyone to sort of feel free to talk about, talk about themselves. So the first thing we're gonna do is we're gonna get up and we're gonna write our salaries on the whiteboard. Ooh, controversial. And it well, and it was. Everyone looked at each other. And thought, what? You know, are you serious? And uh, it's quite quite interesting. So, because um, you know, no one in those days, it, well, even now, in those days, no one talked about salaries. It was no. very private, very confidential. And bear in mind, we had salespeople, customer services people, oh and God. system engineers in the room. Yeah, so much different salary. Yeah, quite a different salary structure. Yeah. yeah. So, so actually, the system engineers uh, went 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 first, and and first guy got up and he wrote his salary on the board, and it was like, um, no, and he basically was like, okay, and then and then he, the other system engineer got up and and wrote their salary on the board, and it was like, quite significantly different. Right. So uh, you can imagine <laughs> the reaction of the first one who got up is like, what is going on? So and and the manager at the time said, no, 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 no. Um, you know, don't worry, don't worry, we'll, talk, we'll take that offline because he was obviously quite upset. 
So uh, interestingly enough, I think I, I said something like, well, I thought it was a safe environment, but that didn't go down too well. But the go on. Sorry. But what, he wouldn't he have known that that person was going that story was going to be different. Yeah, I think it was. This is this Maverick book, by the way, and I haven't read it because it didn't exactly go down too well at the time. So I thought maybe that's not a direction I want to go in. But he basically it was all about unorthodox management techniques. But funnily enough, I guess if I look back upon it, it actually was quite an interesting event for me personally because we then had the salespeople got up and talked about their salaries, which were significantly different. And that was like, for me, I'd always, you know, I'd wanted to get into corporate sales actually when I came across from Australia. And I guess if anything is going to motivate you to go in that direction, when you realize that, you know, if you if you go in that direction, the rewards can be there if you take the leap. That was one of the things that did motivate me. Do you, do you think, and it's an interesting topic because I, I do get this a lot, do you think there's a lot of jealousy internally in companies when they see, um, because there's, there's a lot of perception around salespeople that, yeah. you know, they go out, they do lunches, they have a chat to people, and then they earn loads of money and big commission checks, etc. And some of them, let's be honest, Alistair, some of these commission payments are extortionate. Do you think there's a lot of jealousy in between the sort of the customer services, the service engineers, the marketing, the the, the secretaries, whatever whatever it is, that they actually look at these people and just think, you don't do a lot and you get paid a hell of a lot. So I think there is. Yeah, you're right. There is. Now, I think what makes it interesting is... There is, but I also don't think those that actually, uh, I guess, have those thoughts, they haven't put themselves in the position of going out there. And I think yeah. what they don't realise is is actually, you know, it's, it's, it's heavy lifting and you do put yourself out there. And yes, you do earn, you know, big salaries and big commissions, etc. And funnily enough, though, if you turn it around and say to those people, would you want to do it? The answer is no, in many yeah. cases. And also as well, you're, you're under the spotlight all the time. If you're absolutely. not performing, you're uh, out. Absolutely. If you're not performing, you're out, or you're certainly getting a lot more pressure than than those that, that, that are. Now, interestingly enough, most of the people I worked with at Cisco, who were all SEs, are now all senior salespeople. Really? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Pretty The good SEs... Always turn to the dark side. <laughs> so, I mean, it's a it's a known thing. And actually, I know many of my the best SEs I worked with are now, you know, very senior salespeople or sales managers all around different different organisations. What is the biggest turnoff that you have when meeting someone for an interview? So if they come in, what what, what do you think? Um, I would say, well, firstly, if if they don't look the part, if they don't look smart, and obviously well presented. Uh, I think I think yeah, you know, obviously being prompt on time. And the biggest turnoff for me is just really if they again, as I said before, they haven't done their homework. They don't necessarily know about the company they're applying for, um, and and just again, not really you know ready, prompt, mm. uh, you know, with with punchy pre thought, pre thought. You know, what are you going to talk about? If someone's going to ask you, give me an example of X Y Z. If you haven't thought of a few examples, you can give. You haven't done your homework. What's your view? You, you mentioned there about looking smart appearance. Now, I, I think it's very important in sales to, to look the part and be polished. Yep. Um, I'm not saying suited and booted nowadays. Maybe it might be a shirt, jacket or whatever it is. But if you're going to a meeting, if I went to a new meeting, I, I would still wear probably smart jeans, a shirt and a jacket. I still would try and look yeah. as smart as I can. What is your view now on meetings over video? Because I, I have people turn up, um, new prospects in hoodies. Maybe company hoodies. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I'm not quite saying pajamas, but so they don't. They, they they look like they've just rocked out of bed half the time. And do you think that has now gone out the window a bit? Because I'm I'm looking at it now when you when you have to go to a meeting in London or wherever you're going to be, yeah. you are going to make a bit of an effort. Absolutely. You've got to get the train. You got. But if you're actually at home and you've got an interview or got a meeting, do you have to make an effort now? What, what's your view? I think you absolutely do. And I must admit, you talk about turnoffs. It's sort of ridiculous. If you're having a video interview with someone and they think <laughs> the hoodie is good enough, right? I mean, maybe it's uh, maybe I'm getting old, right? Maybe it's uh, it is it depends on the job, right? Hmm. But if you're if you're a customer front facing position. You should be thinking, hang on, I should be dressed. You might have pajamas on underneath, but that's <laughs> yeah. But ultimately, you should at least look the part, right? And yeah. I think that is that is a fundamental thing because don't forget, decisions are being made on do I want this person to represent my company when you when you're interviewing for someone. So you know that's that's, a, that's you know that's what, the first what should thing. you want now if then if they because there's a lot of roles now where you know I'm not saying it's the death of the external, but uh, externals now have had to sort of 
transition their skills over to more video. Yes, they've got to look smart, but yep. there's almost more pressure now to be on time with the video because if, if I don't know about you, but if someone's not there within seven, eight minutes, I'm out. Totally agree. I'm, I'm out yep. of the meeting. Now, normally, if, they were, if I was here waiting, say, for instance, you turn up 15 minutes late, so I, I actually wouldn't really mind. I'm not, I'm not, uh, yeah, yeah. I, I'm not, T- tardiness I'm not that bothered about it I-, I think you you should be on time but there might be traffic or whatever and someone's running here but if you're on your screen and you're not on out on time I'm basically thinking and, and quite frankly Alistair I forget a lot so I am I am bad for this myself yeah, yeah. but within seven eight minutes I switch off and then try and go to the next meeting so I think, I think you're right there's a three minute rule basically as far as I'm concerned which is you... not long is it no it's not it's not and but but if you think about it I think in the real world there are reasons things can happen right accidents, traffic delays, etc. People can get delayed through no fault of their own. Unless you've had a I mean, you can have an outage, I suppose, but I guess, you know, if someone has if someone's got an internet outage, then should at least be calling you on the mobile phone or something. But I think the tolerance level you're right for being prompt on calls. I mean the worst one of the things that actually really frustrates me about the new video age is people who aren't on the call at the time. Because if you're on a call that runs over and you're previous you're running You've just got to learn to just drop the call that you're on and just move to the next one, because otherwise you're being discourteous to the person who's waiting for you. Do you think as well that the you know the 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 small talk that used to go on in meetings before, you know, we, we'd meet up and chat about the weather, football, yeah, whatever yeah. it is, and you know, we, we would talk about a subject. Then we might debate off during the meeting, and when the meeting stops, then you're still talking those coffee moment, um, water cooler moments. That has gone out the window now. It because, has a bit, yeah, yeah. Because I, I, I'm with you. I, I, I'm very conscious of the time now. I, every time I go on a meeting and I sort of sit for half hour, 40 minutes, I, I, I quite like small talk. So I start small talking for 10 minutes. Yep. Then I'm like, shit, I've got 10 minutes left, 15 minutes left. And then I'm looking with two minutes to go and so I've got to go. I have to get, and the meetings always are rushed. Um, I'm not great in an agenda. So yeah. I, I, I set or talk small talk and then I actually look at the time and think, I've, I haven't got to my point. But I do have to then stop the meeting dead. Do you think we actually now, because for myself, I don't like it. I, I, I find it more difficult over video, um, maybe because I like small talk and a bit more of the interaction in person, but yeah. the meetings have got much more difficult, I think. Yeah, I think it's about, it is really important to get the vibe of the meeting right, depending on the topic. So some some meetings really, you just want to cut to the chase right it's it might be a 15 minute or a 20 minute meeting yeah and and you want to get in cover the topics and get out other meetings i think depending on if they're more social it really is important to try and have that social dialogue about the weather or about you know what's going on because i think that you're right that's the thing that is is not being lost but you have to work to make sure you still have it Otherwise, you lose that rapport building opportunity, particularly if you're selling, right? Yeah. I mean, I've met people over the pandemic in particular. You had to meet people that you'd never met before, and you have to try and develop that rapport with them remotely. And it's harder. It is much harder. It's, it a, it's, a different, it's a different way of selling, and it's a different way of operating than just, you know, the usual meet, greet, have a cup of coffee, etc. Do you, do you look for new skills at doing that? So, for instance, you know, I, I wouldn't call myself an external, but... Um, I think I'm certainly better face to face than I am maybe over the phone. Do you, do you look for people now and think, do you know what? Actually, your video skills aren't that great. Actually, you know, it's a really interesting question because traditionally I would say no, but I'd say yes because mm. actually, if you've got someone who can't come across well in a video environment, that could be a challenge, right? So I do it is think now it, exactly it, big yeah, time yeah, is now, yeah. isn't it? Really. So if you were doing a video interview with someone and they can't can't present themselves well in that environment that's another reason why i think it's important to make sure i mean it's also the the aesthetics what's behind you you know i know that you know if either you you know a lot of people they don't have the space or what have yeah. you make sure that you've at least got an environment or at least make sure you're set up to have something behind you that you know it doesn't look like you're sitting in a closet as it were it was interesting because um i had pip white on the show the md of google mm. And she did the show, show from her bedroom. So I actually saw all okay. her bedroom. And I, and I was like, when well, no, she did the show with her virtually, I actually thought that in the background. I was thinking, Pip, is this the best environment? And she'll probably hear this now when they call me up. But I was actually thinking, I saw her bedroom. I saw her little ornaments. And I thought, why is she doing it from her bedroom? You know what, though? I think that also can have a nice touch as well, a mm. human touch, right? Is yeah. If it's all very staid. Yeah. But I actually think sometimes, actually, it can be nice... It, Again, depending on the type of meeting, right? 
it can soften the environment by yeah. actually having a real world environment as well. So yeah, it's it's, yeah. A, it's a hard one to judge. Now, you mentioned earlier about it's quite good to maybe so, to change jobs every two or three years. Yet you have not done this at all because you've had twenty years at yep. Cisco. So, what advice would you give to someone for whatever reason has had a number of jobs in a short pace of time? The, 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 let's call them the, the, the classic job hoppers. They've yeah. come to you, yeah. they've had a year, two years, a year, two years, a year, two years. Would you employ someone like that? So firstly, it looks terrible on a CV, first yeah. impressions. So you gotta, you got to try and get across in your CV as to why you might have done that. Because I must admit, if, I, if I'm if i reviewing CVs and I see a lot of job hopping, it is a little bit of a warning sign. But Does it you, put you off though? Does it literally think, oh, we need uh, to do Sometimes, yeah, yeah, in all honesty. Yeah. Um, but... I think the key thing is to be honest and upfront if in an interview situation and just say the reason is X, Y, Z. Um, because in the back of any employer's mind, it's always going to be, am I just another 12 months in? So, but I, I do think you've got to have a good reason as to why you did hop around. You know, is it because, I don't know, I, I just, hard, you know, not very hard to get happy or satisfied or settled. Um, but I, I do think it's, it, is a, it is a challenge. It's actually, I, I don't know the workaround around that, apart from having a good reason for why you have actually moved around so much. I mean, from your experience, what do you think? I, 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 I get a lot of people, um, well, let's be honest, no, no salesperson's ever come to me, ever, in 20 years of me recruiting and says, Mark, um, I've been sacked. Yeah. No, no, not no, one, ca- no, not yeah. one candidate yeah. has ever done that. No. Now, you know and I know there's loads of people that have been sacked out there yeah. or, or let go, but they never do that. Um, normally, they actually say they, that it's career progression or they almost tend to come around to me and say, all oh, the tech, they, they've changed, they've got bored mm. of the technology, yeah. which, are, again, you have to look through these things all the time. But I, I normally think if a, if a person hasn't gone past a year, there's a problem. Yeah, I think if it's a salesperson and you've done a lot of job hopping, that would be a warning sign. Yeah, they can't uh, pass probation or whatever no, it is. Exactly. Yeah. But good salespeople, what what I always tell people when I actually speak to clients is um, the the best the best interviewers are the job hoppers. Why? Because they go on so many bloody interviews. Yeah, they're probably right. They've got yeah. enough practice and enough <laughs> feedback all the time. So believe me, they're really, really good at getting interviews and they're really, really good yeah. at getting jobs because quite frankly there you know there's a lot of people out there like a serial jobs because they might go to a company especially the senior people you'd be surprised i don't know if you ever see it, alistair where you'll see um senior sales directors a year six months a year so what happens is they'll go and get the got the gig yep. six month guarantee a year guarantee they get found out they get sacked the only thing is that you, you will see a lot of very smart good sales people do move around a lot as well yeah because guess what they do they go in they blow the number away and then they get given a crazy high target. They don't want to do They say, actually, you know what, I'd rather go somewhere else. And yeah. actually, some of the best salespeople that earn the most money and, and do the best is because they do that. I think it's, a, and, you know, candidly, it, you know, within reason, uh, that's a good reason. Not really, it doesn't sound great if you're interviewing that person. Mind you, though, depending on if you just want to hire someone who's going to do a great job and blow the numbers away, as a sales manager, it's not such a bad thing. Yeah. So it's, it's a balance, I think. My last question for you, Alistair. A lot of people would consider the tech industry, especially within it, a great industry to start their career and kickstart a career. You, you've been in it years yourself and mm-hmm. you've, made a, you've made a great career for yourself. If someone's considering coming into the tech industry, what are the things they should sort of consider when coming into it? You know, what sector, where to go? You know, what considerations should they be thinking about? Yeah, I guess you're talking about graduates or, yeah, gra- or, yeah, yeah, yeah. or graduates anyone from or the people, outside. People just coming into the you know the industry. Yeah, definitely. I think there's been a, a big change in the type of people coming into the tech industry over the last sort of five to ten years. You know, it used to be a, a very male-dominated environment. Yeah. It's not like that anymore. In fact, it's much... It's really, really diverse environment nowadays. Uh, Which is I, great. I, I, I totally agree. And I think I think that's actually... It's broken down a lot of barriers. I think you have to be interested in technology because you're probably in the wrong job if you're not. Uh, you know, I don't think you want to be a Luddite and be a little bit scared of computers because yeah. that's a problem. So I, I generally, I think it's, if you're sort of tech savvy or really interested in technology, um, you've got to be a people person as well. It is a very people-driven you know, industry. Obviously, there's... Even the back office is now quite people orientated. So I think you've got to be a people person. You've got to love tech or at least be interested by it. Um, 
and just be comfortable in that sort of environment where you may spend a lot of time in front of the computer, in front of video, you know, out and about with customers as well. But it's got to be something that that appeals to you. I mean, that's what that's why what I always liked about it, which is why I sort of went on that path and have continued to do different roles within it because I love technology. I'm a bit of a gadget freak, so um, you know, you've got to enjoy the stuff you're selling. Alistair, you've been a great guest. Thanks so much for your time. Cheers. Thank you. Thank you.